Thank you, Rose, and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Craig Vaughn. I'm the president of Castle. Castle manages uh, HOAs, condos, and apartments in the uh, Florida and Texas markets. We partner with about 300 communities um, through seven offices and about 1,750 teammates. Uh, very glad to have you here uh, back this afternoon. Welcome some of you back. Uh, many of you may have joined us three weeks ago when Jeffrey, uh, Jeff and his partner Michael and I addressed the shutting down of amenities. So we have come uh, full circle. We can see a light at the end of the tunnel because today we're going to talk about the reopening of amenities. So much, uh, 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 much better uh, conversation. You know, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your thirst for information. We had uh, around just over 900 registrants this afternoon uh, who submitted uh, almost 600 questions. So we're looking forward to spending the next five hours with you uh, going through each of those questions one by one so that we can make sure everybody's satisfied at the end of our webinar. I'm just kidding, of course. Um, I have taken the liberty of grouping the questions, and there are a lot of similar questions into broad categories and we formulated the agenda together this afternoon so that we can address as many of those questions um, as possible. To the extent we can't get your questions, we, we are going to uh, have episode number three on May 21st at the same time. So I would encourage you uh, to sign up for that webinar and we'll get to some new topics and then certainly some of the topics that we haven't been able to uh, get to today. Um, as Rose said, you're welcome to ask questions through the Q&A feature. Um, we can see them. I will, my, uh, when I, my head's darting around up and down, I'm not daydreaming. I'm not nodding off. I'm actually uh, reading the questions and seeing if we can't uh, fit them into our discussion this afternoon. <clears throat> uh, just as a matter of course, I do see we have some new Zoom users. We are using the Zoom platform this afternoon. Uh, before we do these webinars, we do check in. The platform's performing well, which probably means something will happen. Uh, but if it does, uh, the advice to you is as simple as I get from our IT team. It is shut off your computer, turn uh, log in, log out, uh, log out, log back in again, and it, and it should work. Uh, that's what we'll do as well. So if we freeze, uh, we'll be back at you. Uh, before I ask the panel to quickly introduce myself, uh, themselves, I want to remind everyone that this is a conversation. Jeff and Allison uh, volunteered their time this afternoon. They're not intending to provide specific legal advice for your community. Um, you know, for those types of questions, you should go directly to your uh, legal counsel and advisors. Brandon and I, it's an opportunity for us to provide information to you regarding reopening and answer some questions that have come up. So before we jump in, uh, Jeff, uh, if I could turn it over to you for a second so that you could uh, introduce uh, Kay Bender-Rembaum. Sure. Kay Bender-Rembaum. We are a community association law firm, 19 lawyers. Almost half of us are board certified in the field. We represent a little over 1,200 of Florida's community associations, and this is what we do 99.9% .9 of the time. I lecture, I write, I publish on matters of importance to board members and managers all the time. Many of you already received my uh, column, Rembombs Association Roundup. Over 250 some odd articles have been published over the years. Its new home is in the Florida Community Association Journal. It appears to be fading in and out of the monitor at the moment. Technology is wonderful. Um, I'd also like to introduce Allison Hertz, but before I do, a very special hello from my partner, Michael Bender. He apologizes that he could not be here today. Something came up very, very last minute, but he's asked me to let everybody know, yes, he's fine. Yes, he's healthy. Thank God, no. He does not have COVID-19, and he will be back with us. Just something came up, and he couldn't be with us today, but he'll be back with us on the 21st. Hello, Michael. If you're out there watching, I suspect you are. Allison Hertz, wonderful lawyer. She's been with K. Bender Rembaum for three years. Say hello, Allison, while I introduce you. Hi, everyone. Hi. She, she's board certified. She lectures quite a bit. Her clients absolutely love her. And I think you're in for a real treat having her with us on the webinar this morning. This is going to be a lot of fun. If you see me moving around, just know that I, too, I'm trying to answer questions and I have to reach a little far to my computer so that I can get to your questions and type the answers and such. And I look forward to the next hour, Craig. Back to you. Great. Or to Brandon. Brandon uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and Flashridge. Great. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everybody. And thank you for joining us. I am the president of Plastridge Insurance and also an owner. 
We are a 100-year-old uh, insurance agency uh, established in Delray Beach in 1919. One of our core areas is working with associations. It's our largest uh, demographic of business, and we insure over 1,000 associations. And I hope that I can add some value and answer some questions and um, make everybody a little more comfortable with what's going on from an insurance standpoint. Thank you. Great, Brendan, appreciate that. And we don't have a specific insurance topic on the uh, agenda today. And if we can move to the agenda, I'd like to take you through it. But we have Brendan here to add his uh, flavor to a number of the topics we're gonna discuss today. So we do appreciate uh, you sticking around and, and, and checking in, Brendan, thank you. Uh, our agenda today, uh, we're gonna cover five things. One, the current legislative uh, environment first. A reopening framework, I, I'm gonna take you through kind of a strategy we, we've, um, embraced a castle with respect to drafting an opening plan for your community. We want to talk about today's reality. Um, you know, what is going on? What are the governor's orders saying? What does that really mean on a granular level, which there are a lot of questions on? We'll talk a little bit about what's next. And if we have time, uh, we'll, we'll do some Q&A at the end. So I think we should, uh, you know, jump right in if we can. Uh, Jeff, it, it seems everyone is issuing executive orders. The president, our governor, the mayors, our counties on the municipal level. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a legislative minefield out there for associations and directors. Um, we're still under a state of emergency, of course, uh, at least until tomorrow at this point. But can you give us an overview of the regulatory environment? And uh, I, I will indeed. I sure will. Right now, as you just mentioned, we're under Executive Order 2052. 2052 went into effect on March 9th and expires tomorrow, May 8th. That's the one, that's the big one. That created the state of emergency in the state of Florida. It was created for 60 days. We'll all be holding our breaths, waiting to see tomorrow, does the governor extend the state of emergency? And I know we're gonna talk more about that in a few minutes. And we're gonna fast forward because from March 9th through April 29th, remember we started on order 2052. And then all of a sudden in just a few days, from then, it, we're up to order 2112, and that's the reopen order for those of you that want to look it up. That's the one that says no bar or nightclub that gets greater than 50% of its revenues can reopen right now. Restaurants can reopen, but only to 25% capacity, maintaining six feet between tables. Commercial gyms and fitness centers are still closed. Vacation rental prohibitions remain in effect. The uh, in-store retail establishments uh, are starting to open up to 25% of building occupancy. There's even partial voluntary medical procedures subject to certain conditions that are possible to um, schedule again. And that applies to everybody but Palm Beach County, Broward County, Miami. And Is that the order? Yeah, I, I went out for a second, but I'm back. The... Um, Governor made room so that local leadership in these three counties can be in consultation with him at any time. And once that consultation occurs and the governor agrees, then our counties can start to reopen as well. And then we also have, and what we'll be talking about today, are the local orders from Palm Beach County, Broward, and Miami-Dade dealing with issues that are important to our community associations in terms of what types of activities can we participate in. And then we'll be talking about swimming pools and tennis and basketball and opening general amenities, face coverings, et cetera. Great, Jeff. Thank you. And, and I think it's important for our participants to understand, you know, there are like 67 counties in the state. We can't hope to address all of those. They're all subject to different uh, regulations, as Jeff just said. So we're going to focus in on uh, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade. Um, and they're more restrictive. Those, those uh, guidelines are more restrictive than what the rest of the state is covering. Uh, so uh, you can take some comfort in the fact that you're in a better spot than uh, we are down here from a regulation standpoint at this point. Um, before we get into uh, the specific orders, I wanted to just run our participants through kind of what CASEL has decided to do with respect to uh, opening of amenities. So some of you may recall from our last discussion a couple of weeks ago, we did have a playbook for the shutting down of amenities, which is a uh, waterfall approach to, to shutting things down. And, and we're advocating 
for a, a, a reverse approach, step-by-step approach to winding your operations back up again. Because we manage all of the state, obviously one plan can't fit everybody. So we've kind of crafted a, a framework um, that you can then draft, you can then create a, an individual community specific plan, acknowledging that you may have different regulations that you're, you're subject to, your physical, you may have different physical plant limitations, different demographics, different staffing, different, uh, and different budgets. So we're happy to make our playbook available to you. Um, you can uh, email us at info at castlegroup.com and we'll have someone send it to you and uh, you're welcome to use it. But I do want to take you quickly through kind of what our thinking was. Um, first of all, it's, it's hugely important to have a plan. I think everyone would agree. Um, if you're going into this haphazard, you're not going to be successful. And then once you have that plan, it's equally as important to communicate it out to your residents. Because, you know, the first thing you hear is that the pool can open and everybody can go swimming and all these things. And that's not how it works. So we want to make sure we're managing the expectations of the owners that live within our communities so that we don't have to readdress them every time something uh, happens. So our framework asks each board member to consider, I'm going to read these. What are the current regulations affecting my community, both state, muni county, and municipal? What are the recommendations of the CDC that I still have to abide by? What amenities do I have that are affected by the regulations? What are the demographics of my community? Does the setup of my amenities provide in, any limitation on reopening? And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Do I have the staffing financial, do I have any staffing or financial limitations relative to opening my amenities? So what this creates is the guidepost, right? The guideposts under which now you can look to your specific community and figure out how you're gonna bring your amenities online. So we're recommending that you know, the board have a workshop or a meeting and draft a plan, phased plan uh, for your community. It can be more restrictive than the regulations. That is absolutely the case. And I know Jeff and, and Alice are gonna talk about that. You aren't, you aren't, uh, you don't have to do everything. You can't, you can't be any looser than the state. Uh, or the local municipality, but you can, you can have, be more restrictive, I think is important. So what we want you to do is sit down and here's your checklist. What do the regulations allow me to open now? Let's specifically talk about that, pools being a good example. What amenities do I have? Do I have any limitations on what I can open? So by way of example, physical limitations. Is my pool a tiny 10 person kidney shaped pool at a small community? Um, you know, that's going to restrict what I can't have a whole community in the pool because we got very specific rules around capacity. Um, do I have a small gym where I can't literally people, if I had three people in, they can't be six feet apart. Are these limitations on my plan? Staffing limitations. And we're going to talk a lot about that. There's a lot of questions on uh, some, in some spots, I have to monitor the use of the amenities. How does that look if I don't have staff? What are the demographics of, our, of my community? We manage a lot of communities in the 55 and better space. Uh, you know, some were 55 and better 25 years ago. So that population is highly um, subjected to uh, the virus. And, you know, do we have the same rules in those communities as we do in some of our younger communities? Will I restrict hours? Will we restrict guests? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. What other amenities do I have that I need to plan for? So gym, a clubhouse, card room, because what's next? This plan uh, should, be, should make sense from, should address all of my amenities because they are going to come online at some point in time. Um, the last thing we think we should be considering is when will we ease restrictions on guests? So you, you can appreciate we have a framework, a guide post, and then we have a, a you know, kind of a specific uh, plan for my community. We have a saying at Castle, don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. So we're on draft four of our opening plan because we get feedback and we see what works and what makes sense. And we get, we get feedback from the legal community. I know Allison and Jeff have, have reviewed our plan and, and I'm sure uh, and, you know, would agree with our strategy, I hope. I'll ask them to comment on that. But uh, we're getting lots of feedback. So we're, it's an iterative process. We're going through this you know, every week and, and the association will do the same thing. As the, as the regulations change, where well, you could open changes, you know, you'll have already thought through the opening of my gym, the opening of my clubhouse, you know, the card rooms, whatever, you know, the, the, uh, the, fit, the uh, well, gym and fitness, the same thing, but all of those uh, things that are nuanced to your community. 
So you have the framework, draft a plan, communicate the plan, implement the plan, monitor and adjust the plan um, as, as regulations change, and then communicate it again. So that's kind of what we're recommending everybody does. Again, we have that framework available for you. I know I talked very quickly, um, so uh, I, I do apologize, but uh, you know, the opening of all amenities is, is inevitable, so we're suggesting you have a plan. Jeff and Allison, you've seen our plan. Is our strategy a good one, and are you seeing anything else out there that we should incorporate into our plan? The plan is very well organized, which is appreciated for all of us and for the clients. I think they need help getting organized in some ways here, and I think the plan helps with the communication, which is key here. We need to communicate, 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 as you said, and I can't emphasize that really enough. If you want to have restrictions or if you want to have restrictions on reopening, you need to communicate. Right. Okay, good. Well, again, uh, that we are prepared, uh, we'll make that available to anybody that wants it. And it does include templates for correspondence and all those types of things. I see Jeff is on mute, um, which, worked a long time to make happen but ah there you go <laughs> Welcome back. you like having that switch now <laughs> i know about to get to you again right now um because i want to move on to where we're where are we now and and you know what is the state of affairs so All right jeff you previously advised that the government governor's issued kind of that state's phase one of its reopening plan um it has specific implications for the associations that we manage um from a community standpoint can you walk us through uh, what does the order allow us to reopen? At the moment, remember that the governor's order is really dealing with a lot of the commercial aspects, whereas the county's orders are dealing with a lot of our residential local uh, yeah. aspects right now. Governor, though, has said, as we've already talked about, that many of those commercial enterprises were still not qualified yet to open in our um, three counties. For those that want to follow along with us today, it's Palm Beach County Order Number 5, it's Broward Order 2008, and it's Miami-Dade Order 21-20 that all speak to the reopening of amenities in our residential associations in one fashion or another. God forbid the three counties have consulted with each other. God forbid it be easy to read. Um, they, they certainly uh, could have spent a little bit more time, I think, most especially Palm Beach County, in not creating confusion and giving clear direction to the constituents. And we'll be talking about that in further detail in just a minute. Um, that's uh, that, fair, Jeff. And I think we are going to focus our discussion on Broward, Palm Beach, and uh, Miami Dade. You know, it's kind of almost humorous. The, the, the leadership of those three counties got together and said, listen, we need to be on the same page here. Otherwise, we're going to have people running from Miami-Dade to swim in the pool in Palm Beach. And so that was great. And then they all, uh, they all um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, adopted completely different regulations. So uh, it was, uh, and that's the job for attorneys. And that's what keeps you guys in business. But while they agreed that it was, uh, sorry, sorry, Jeff, so, there's some confusion over the differing, reg differing regulations between the counties. There sure is. And I think the best way to talk about it is let's, let's divide it up a little bit. So if we talk about pools, specifically Palm Beach County pools, yep. then we can talk about Broward pools. Miami-Dade, we don't have to talk about pools because, well, they can't open yet anyway for the reader who just asked that question or for the watcher who just asked that question. Would you like me to address the Palm Beach County pool uh, debacle, for lack of a better yes, word. Yes, uh, please do. Please do. All right. So again, Palm Beach County Order Number Five: Facility staff or management must be present. That's written in Order Number Five. The pool capacity is limited to the CDC social distance guidelines. We need to talk about how to interpret that. Very simply, it's a six-foot uh, distance that we need between us. So length times width divided by six. Some people suggest length times width divided by 36 to create, if you will, a six times six uh, bubble around the participant in the swimming pool and make it even that much safer. Locker and shower rooms remain closed. Restrooms must be cleaned regularly and disinfected regularly. Pool deck seating needs to be restricted to comply with the CDC guidelines. Now, let's go all the way back to the very first item we started talking about. This requires active monitoring. Um, to those of you, I received an email earlier today on this and asked, was asked to bring this up. 
you know, monitoring, can we monitor from a distance? Can facility staff or management do that and fulfill the requirement? That's a very good question. You're going to have to answer it on a case by case basis, because if that person isn't fully monitoring and they're doing their regular duties, they're not really monitoring. Who are you kidding? Um, here's where the confusion really comes in. The order says facility staff or management must be present. In my eyes, you want to be safe. That means you need someone there at the pool. Palm Beach County website, April 28th, there was a posting from the county that said that to fulfill that requirement, you can use volunteers. I may ask a simple question to everybody who's watching. In today's litigious world, it's um, while remote, it could certainly happen that a personal injury lawyer represents a client alleging that the failure of the association to properly comply with Palm Beach County Order Number Five led to or participated in their client contracting COVID-19. What's a better defense that you had facility staff or management at the pool deck, or that you followed the comment that was? on the 420 on April 28th on the Palm Beach County website where staff said, well, okay, volunteers can fulfill that requirement. If you're going to go with volunteers, then I think there's four or five points you really, really, really need to consider. Uh, the first one we've already talked about, if God forbid you are sued and you're that one unlucky association, where would you, what would you have rather had the physical person there or, would you have uh, the uh, volunteer? I think I'd rather have the facility staff or management present at the pool. There's other things we can talk about, and I think it's going to bring Brendan into this uh, conversation in just a moment. Uh, but legal defense coverage is something that I think we should talk about. Does the association have it? Do is, the vol is the association prepared for it? Does it have volunteer coverage for the acts of the volunteer itself? Is the volunteer a member of a board sanctioned committee? And should it be? Does it need to be? Is the volunteer covered in the governing documents for indemnity? It, will the volunteer be indemnified if God forbid something happens to the volunteer? So Brandon, those were all insurance type uh, issues. I thought maybe we'd ping over to you for a little bit to discuss that. Jeff, thank you. So the intent of the, the directors and officers liability policy, which is, which is there to protect the board uh, and the property manager or the management company uh, from decisions and objections uh, from the unit owners. That's the, the, way, the best way to remember directors and officers, we call it DNO, is that it's there to protect you from decisions and objections uh, that may come up. The policy under who is an insured covers past, present, and future directors. It covers your manager and your management company and the language in all the forms that are the common insurers of that type of policy also include committees working under the direction of the board. Now, that's good and well, except for the fact that many of these policies have exclusions for any kind of communicable disease or viruses. So, you know, while I can't give you a direct specific answer, it's very likely that the company that is offering you directors and officers liability has language in there that would either limit or eliminate coverage uh, for an issue related to this virus. What about, so, but Brandon, just specifically for volunteers, uh, I heard board of directors, uh, committee, will volunteers monitoring the pool, do you think they will be protected or if they're not, what would the association do? Because we're getting a lot of questions of, can we use volunteers? Right. And I think, you know, in, under normal circumstances, if, if this was, you know, a, another situation and, and nothing to do with the virus, the volunteers would ab absolutely be covered under the director's officer's liability. The big problem is that the policy has language generally that is, that's an absolute exclusion for anything to do with uh, a virus or a communicable disease. So, the reality is, you know, I would say in a general way that volunteers would not be covered or would the board, not, the policy would not provide coverage. So if that's the case, uh, Allison or Jeff, um, what, 
what do you recommend? Is there, are there things they can, uh, an association can do if they want to use volunteers to mitigate the fact that, you know, they won't be covered if someone sues them, correct, Brendan? Uh, correct. As a result, they, you know, um, excuse me, believing that they got COVID-19 because that wasn't properly, there wasn't proper monitoring at the pool. What can well, they I've do? Written, well, we've written to the um, county attorney. We've had correspondence back and forth asking them to put out a clarification order so that in the order itself, it provides that volunteers can be used, safely used, which would then pave the way and we wouldn't have to worry so much about that liability issue to begin with. They've taken it under advisement and in typical governmental fashion, nothing has happened. Allison? Yeah, going back to Broward and Dade, just to mention them just a little bit here. Dade, Jeff already mentioned, the pools are still closed. Pools are an amenity which are still completely closed there, so not much to talk about for Dade, Miami. Broward, they're open similar to Palm Beach County, but under slightly different conditions that are, I guess, somewhat problematic as well. Just I'll just read some of them. Um, first, you have to maintain CDC guidelines, obviously the six feet separation. A threshold issue on Broward pools is you can only have capacity for both the deck and the pool at no greater than 50%. So then you also have to do one of two other things. You have to ensure that the pool is supervised by a sufficient number of employees or other persons designated by the housing development. Um, and ensure that the facilities are sanitized, meaning the outdoor chairs, railing, gates, tables, showers, or you have to remove all furnishings from the pool deck. So it's an either or in Broward County, meaning supervision along the lines of what Jeff advised for Palm Beach County, or removing the furniture. Um, in terms of using volunteers, just uh, in, a, in a basic fashion, if you're going to use them despite what we all know and what Jeff has advised in, in his roundup and today, they need to be trained. You can't just throw the obligation to volunteers or committee members and have the volunteers and committee members be regulating and enforcing with no guidelines. So the board must ensure that the committee, the volunteers are provided with written clear guidelines under which they are supposed to enforce. That's a threshold issue to me. If you don't give your committee or volunteer any education, any training, any guidelines, I see that as very problematic. Okay, um, <clears throat> so crystal clear. Um, I think if I can summarize and correct me if I'm wrong, so Broward and, and Palm Beach are different. Uh, Palm, uh, Broward only requires monitoring in certain circumstances, Allison, is that correct? If you have oh. pool, yeah, if you have pool furniture removed, it appears no monitoring is required. But the fifty percent rule still applies. Still applies. And then Jeff, Palm Beach County, um, we do require monitoring. There's a uh, there's not great guidance from uh, the the county on whether a volunteer can be used uh, to do that. Well, right. Uh, you're waiting for clarification. Is that correct? Yes, we'd like to get better clarification for the associations in Palm Beach County on that. County, if you're we, listening, if you're watching, please take care of that. <laughs> but if the association is going to use volunteers, they should be trained. It's not really just a question of sitting by the pool. They should be trained on, you know, what we want them to monitor, those types of things. Is that, is that Absolutely. Um, and that, they, that's, should, yes. they should also be, be advised by the board that, you know, they don't want the volunteers getting into altercations and in enforcing these restrictions. I think that's very important to mention that the volunteers need to gently remind of these restrictions. And if people aren't complying, their duty is to then report to the board or management for follow up. And if the associations can't get a handle on enforcement, the codes all say that the facilities must be shut down because they would not be in compliance. So it's, just, it's a gentle issue where the committee members and volunteers are put into a, a precarious situation that they now are sort of policing and it could be problematic as well. So just to ping off of that a little bit, just because the amenity can be opened subject to these guidelines doesn't mean the association has to open them. For example, if you have good reasoning as to 
just not even, uh, it doesn't have to be that great of reasoning, I suppose. If an association exercising its reasonable business judgment doesn't want to open the amenities at this time, it really doesn't have to. We have the state of emergency still in play, and that gives board members tremendous flexibility in deciding who can come into the association and when, what, which amenities can be opened and closed, et cetera. And just because that emergency order comes to an end doesn't mean those emergency powers as of that moment eviscerate as if they never existed. They wind down slowly. The emergency power statutes tell us that the authority granted by them is limited to that time reasonably necessary to protect the health, the safety, the welfare of the association, its owners, <clears throat> its family members, its tenants, its guests, agents, invitees, and to mitigate further damage and make emergency repairs. So if you're still trying to mitigate further damage because in the area where your association, perhaps there's an outbreak of COVID-19, maybe you would want to remain a little bit more uh, closed, a little bit more stringent than somebody uh, 40 miles away. Palm Beach County is a very big place. Right. And just to mention in Palm Beach County with the pools, it's not only monitoring the deck for the six foot issue, the monitors are also supposed to ensure that the bathrooms are continuously sanitized and cleaned and that there is soap or hand sanitizer there. So these monitor volunteers are not only out on the deck, they're now going to check the facilities as well. And maybe they have a checklist and, and keep track of when they did this. So it's more complicated than somebody's out on the pool deck. I right. think you definitely right. want to have a checklist in the uh, facilities how often those activities are being conducted just for the association's own protection. Yep, we are getting some questions and there are a number of, of pre-questions before the, uh, the webinar about the restroom issue. Um, do, I think the order you told me in Palm Beach says that it does require that the, a restroom be open, is that correct? Well, no, it doesn't say it has to be open. What it says is the locker room shower remains closed and okay. restrooms, as Allison alluded to, have to be cleaned, disinfected, have the hand sanitizer. As to whether the restroom can be closed or must be opened in conjunction with the pool, I think is something we would need to look into just a little bit further if there's a companion requirement in the city that a restroom remain open for use of the community pool, then yes, they go hand in hand. But if not, then I think you could close one or the other. Right. It's gonna be a case by case basis. And what, what if we do have some questions around, okay, now I, I have one facility, it's washroom, it's, it's bathrooms and showers and sauna. Uh, do I rope them off? Do I just use a reasonable judgment in terms of a sign that says do not use? Um, is there any recommendation? Well, you, you could certainly um, disallow people from using the locker room and the shower while giving access to the restroom facility uh, right. as long as you adhere to the other requirements. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Guys, Greg, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to add one thing in regards to the volunteers, you know, since it's likely the insurance would not provide them with protection, you know, I think that it'd be wise for the association to at least let those volunteers know that, uh, that that's the likelihood. I, I don't know what the, on the legal side, I don't know what the association could do uh, as far as indemnification, hold harmless language to make them feel comfortable, but if I was asked to volunteer, I would certainly want to know that there's a potential there's no coverage. Fair comment. Yeah. And in fact, one of our associations, we just did a quick resolution for the board so that uh, at least from a rulemaking perspective, until the governing documents can be amended, the board has made that affirmative decision that in fact, volunteers will be indemnified by the association if they do provide volunteer. But the volunteering is being done, not just volunteer. First, the board has created a committee so that it's more of an official function. And then the volunteer comes through that committee. They're a committee member. So it, it's trying to do everything we can to trigger the insurance policies if God forbid they're later needed. That's but I think it's fair to say if you're watching this and you've been asked to be a committee member or a volunteer that you know, these are the issues and it's not just association liability there's the potential for you to sort of get roped into that as well. Therefore, that's why we're all so cautious. Exactly, there's already been a situation, I think somewhere where somebody was pushed into the pool for trying to enforce. So if you're in a situation at your pool deck, and, <clears throat> and for example, we, I had read an inquiry from a reader about, um, hey, we think we're just gonna close down the 
pool and if people come and use it and that's uh, who are we to stop them basically well no that's wrong if you're a board member and the facility is closed you cannot turn a blind eye and think you're doing an end run around palm beach county order number five just because you close the pool and the residents are now using it and you say well i close it so i don't have to worry about it no way that's not accurate Brendan, in the situation where there's the volunteer who happens to get pushed into the pool and is injured, is there coverage for that situation? You know, Allison, the difficulty with this whole discussion when it comes to insurance is the fact that this is unprecedented. The, the reality is that we all know that insurance policies take years and years, decades to develop the language that makes those policies common. Um, you know, with the, where the language is, is somewhat common from one company to another, right? And the reality is that pandemic specifically is not in any of those uh, common policies that serve associations. So, you know, some companies may, uh, you know, step up and cover an incident like that. And some companies will do everything they can to tie it to the, the virus. So it's not a clear answer, but it, it's, it's going to be uh, more company specific is the reason I can't give a direct answer. So, you know, I can't say whether it would be covered, but I, I would certainly follow uh, Jeff's advice as far as creating a committee and having volunteers because the committee, the language in the DNO policy is very specific. Uh, about committees under the direction of the directors and officers are covered. That's, I think, a great point. And, and <clears throat> so if I'm hearing that correctly, if you're going to have volunteers do the pool, get your pool monitoring committee together under the auspices of the board that may protect you in some way, shape, or form relative to your DNO policy. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Well, that's, that's great. That's great guidance for, uh, for our webinar listeners, because there are lots of people wondering about how I'm going to monitor my pool. I want to get one, to one more thing on the monitoring. Um, the, uh, not necessarily monitoring, but we are getting a lot of, uh, a lot, several boards asking us uh, whether or not we should utilize a waiver uh, signed by the owner before they use the pool. Jeff, uh, Allison, have you been asked? And, and what is your guidance to the associations? They yes, don't have, can. yeah, there you go. Um, they don't have a whole lot of value to them. First and foremost, how can you ask an owner to sign a waiver for that which they already have the lawful right to use in the first place? So just lay that down as presby. I suppose if in the declaration there was a provision that allowed for the waiver, then I'm fully in favor, and then I think it would probably pass muster. But assuming the declaration is silent on the issue, then uh, I don't see much chance for enforcement on that issue. Allison, I, I don't see the I, waiver being upheld. But I mean, waivers are disfavored anyway in Florida. And the fact that people already have the right to use facilities leads me to believe that they're not really enforceable. If somebody doesn't have the right to use a certain facility, and sometimes we 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 will draw them up, but I would I have uh, been against them in this situation. And I, I suppose the ultimate answer, Craig, as well, could be, I suppose you could ask a member to sign it. You know, you could, and then you deal with the consequences from there. Right, right. Um, one more thing on monitoring before we uh, we we leave that topic. Um, we are getting some questions around, well, my security, I have a security guard in the guard house and I, pu I have cameras at the pool. Jeff, I think you touched on the issue, but, you know, um, is that going to be, do you think, an acceptable format of monitoring uh, the pool? Well, how can the fellow behind the pool monitor fulfill the restroom requirement to clean and disinfect? So that's just one small part of it. Sure. If the person is truly sitting behind a monitor and there's three cameras, four cameras, five cameras covering every angle of the pool deck, and that's what they're doing. They're sitting and they are fully engaged and fully watching. But short of that, no, you can't just say, okay, because it's on our security system, we're monitoring it. That does not pass muster. Very narrow so, band of acceptable. It, it boils yeah. down to a case-by-case -case basis, as Jeff suggests. 
And if you are in the case where it's feasible, then I think there's a place for it. But typically speaking, I don't think it's going to cut it. Um, I think what we're, what, for those of you, for everyone listening, I think the key here is this is, this is a slippery slope. You know, we're suggesting you, you draft a plan, but really sit down with your attorney, make sure you've dotted the I's and crossed the T's because um, you're going to, you could possibly create some liability for the association by not doing this uh, properly. Um, guys, we focused in on, uh, on pools, but we do have tennis players and we do have basketball players and we do have, uh, you know, bocce players out there. What about those amenities and associations? Um, generally speaking, it appears that a lot of outdoor activities are, are going to be open with certain limitations. It appears at this point that uh, the rec facilities indoor are not going to be open, but for Miami-Dade, you are allowed to have sports skill practice by individuals and their family members. You can shoot a basketball, you can dribble a soccer ball, you can play racquetball solo. Tennis is allowed. Um, no pools again, no playgrounds. Broward, very similar. Outdoor activities appear to be okay. Again, CDC guidelines have to be maintained. Tennis, singles, okay. Basketball, okay. Passive activities. Palm Beach County has allowed tennis expressly and racquetball for singles um, with, with monitoring, but it doesn't use the word present. So there are a lot of outdoor activities that have been opened up in all three of these counties, even with the special uh, circumstances going on. And, and in all instances, each of them require the CDC guidelines be adhered to. So that means if someone is not from your household, that means you are six feet apart. You can only be within six feet if they are actually in your household. Allison, you mentioned that tennis was uh, allowable in Miami-Dade. My notes reflect otherwise, so I just wanted to double back on that. It says no. um, organized or competitive play on courts is prohibited, except single tennis play may be allowed. Okay, so we do have single tennis play only, so no double matches. Correct. And then just specific to Brower, just to mention that the order does provide that it's residents only, which makes sense. You, sh you know, we are still right. under the stay at home order anyway, so others should not be coming over to participate in recreational facilities. But it does say that expressly in Broward. Broward's ordinance is pretty clear. And another example of, of why I wish they would have all just used the uh, same um, type orders from the three counties. Going back to the basketball, Miami-Dade solo play is okay. Broward, single player is okay. Palm Beach County, not even addressed. So it, it would be nice to get some better clarity and better conjunction because we are so close with our neighbors. Palm Beach, County, Palm Beach County says the tennis and outdoor racket are okay. Single play permitted only. No locker rooms. Um, so again, they're pretty consistent with single play. What about, but no requirement to monitor like we have with the pools, correct? Well, in Palm Beach County, it says that, it, that you must ensure, they all say you must ensure compliance. Right. So whether they use the term monitoring, supervision, whatever other term, the associations can't forget that whenever they open any facility, they're responsible for ensuring compliance with CDC regulations, which is a big, big feat for them. It, it really is to ensure compliance, which is different. And I want to draw the contrast between in all of these activities, ensuring compliance with CDC guidelines versus Palm Beach County pools, facility staff or management must be present. So that's why you have that uh, additional requirement that we talked about with Palm Beach County pools. Mm -hmm. um, we, get, we have a lot of questions about the gyms. Uh, we, we had pools first, kind of then uh, other amenities. Now we're on to the gyms. And can you... Uh, give us a quick update on the status of opening the gym in my community. The well, the, it's really an interesting question because the prior state orders closed commercial gyms down. Um, best way for me to answer that question, remember that the associations can always be more restrictive than state. They can always be more restrictive than county or city uh, orders on these subjects. Could you think of a better place to catch COVID-19 than in the place where everybody's handling the same gym equipment? I don't know. 
seems kind of dangerous to me. I think I'm going to stay away from that for a while. Uh, Miami-Dade, though, the gyms are still closed. Broward, they're still closed. Palm Beach County does not address the situation. Right. So common sense yeah. would suggest uh, sit tight at this point. That's kind of what we're recommending. I would. Yeah. Although in, in your plan, I think you're going to have to, you know, flush out. Soon the clubhouses will be open. You know, there are CDC guidelines. Do you have, a, you know, do you have your, your treadmills are two feet apart. You do every third one. Like you're going to have right. to and, about those. And when you open the clubhouse, so many of the clubhouses, uh, especially in some of the HOAs and condos too, um, board members come and congregate. They have coffee together. They catch up on different things that are happening. And I think that activity in and of itself has got to not occur until at least we're in a phase three situation. So really when the business offices of the associations open back up, when the clubhouses open back up, I think we need to have certainly in phase one specific need to be in that building. Maybe phase two, it starts to relax a little bit in phase three, it's wide open again. Right. Right. Um, so now I'm playing tennis and I, and I, I have to make, make sure I have a role as a board member to make sure that there's compliance with the CDC guidelines. Can I just put up a sign that says, by the way, here are the guidelines. Don't stand six feet together. Don't stand closer than six feet together um, and wash your hands every day. Like how does signage help me at all? I think signage is going to help, but I don't think it go, it's going to be the sole activity that you do to ensure compliance here. I think that's one of many tools that you need to have to do what you need to do. I think putting up a sign at the tennis court is helpful. Uh, and as Jeff said, there's no express requirement that somebody be present, but I think somebody needs to check on it. Again, have the sort of a checklist risk management protocol that you've developed for your unique needs to make sure that you have some backup in your file if there's a problem at a later time. And we all need to remember that maybe you can ensure compliance for part of the day. So whether you'd like to have your tennis courts open nine to five, you would like to, but maybe you can only ensure compliance nine to 12. So there's a, a opportunity to just scale back and still have people out there enjoying themselves. You know, Allison, I think that's a great point. You know, there's lots of questions from associations with limited resources to monitor. My, my, you know, my manager's only here a couple of hours a day. Well, you don't have to, you, you can scale down the use of your amenities. You don't have to have them open like before the pandemic when, you know, the pool is open dusk to dawn, seven days a week, those types of things. One of the tools you have as a board is to restrict the use, continue to restrict, open them up, but restrict the use. Um, Brendan, any comments, the signage help us when we're dealing with an insurance claim? So in regards to signage, generally the uh, general liability policies don't have a lot of language in regards to what the signage should, should say during normal times. The, the, there are policies that want to see that the, pool, the, the pool has the uh, proper uh, markings for the depth, that the pool is not guarded, that the pool is available uh, between certain times in the day. Those are, those are general for normal times. And, and when you take out a general liability policy, you will have an inspection. And those are some of the things they're looking for when they do those inspections. Uh, in terms of signage for this, again, kind of unprecedented event, there really isn't anything in the policy because there, ha there hasn't been a lot of uh, litigation and court decisions to help the insurance companies develop that language. I know a lot of associations want to use the signs and say, use at your own risk. But the fact remains that these orders say the associations assure, ensure compliance with certain standards. So those are really can't be reconciled very well with, you know, use at your own risk when you have an obligation right. on the other side. Um, and I just I got a news flash in, uh, Craig, just now uh, from Michael, who must be watching us. Broward issued a order extending the state of emergency to May 12th. It took place on May 5th for seven days. But even though they did that, the Broward associations need to check with their local council because I believe the emergency powers set out in Chapter 7, 18, 719, and 720, dealing with our homeowner associations, cooperative and condominium associations, 
in order to use those emergency powers require the state of emergency as declared by the governor, not a local county. But I will confirm that for us and let us all know in the next seven minutes before we end. Great. Well, that's actually a great pivot into the next topic, which is what's next? Um, you know, the, the emergency order expires tomorrow. Be interested in your comments in a second or whether or not you think that will be uh, renewed, uh, extended. If it's not, what does that mean? And then, you know, certainly the some associations took actions shutting down their amenities because of the uh, under the auspices of the emergency order and the, and the, and the new power, emergency powers in the statute. So that's a loaded question. So let's start with, we could have a new day tomorrow. What are your feelings about the extension of the emergency order? I think the governor just might extend it for a while because of the interplay with the federal government and funding and things like that that occur because of the state of emergency. And I don't know that he'll have the same access if the state of emergency uh, isn't renewed. So that'll be a really interesting issue to see. And then, Allison, um, they lift the state of emergency, uh, contrary to Jeff's uh, recommendation to the governor. Um, what does that mean for our associations who have adopted some of these policies? And let's use specifically the limitations on utilization of the clubhouse. Uh, what does it mean for them? Do they have to open tomorrow? You're correct. A lot of the associations have taken action and restriction, restricting access under the emergency powers statute of 718, 19 and 20, which allows you to do certain things in response to a state of emergency by the governor. So Jeff did indicate a couple minutes back that that doesn't just come to an end once the governor's order ends. We are allowed to sort of wind down and use the emergency powers for as long as necessary to mitigate the damage associated with this pandemic. I don't think that's forever. I think that's subjective. And I think once again, that's a case by case basis, depending on where you are here in the state, first of all, and what you have going on at your facility. I think the emergency powers are going to extend a little bit. That's not a legal term, a little bit. Um, <laughs> The board also has regular authority though, frankly, to have rules and regulations and policies that are reasonable for the safety, health, and welfare of the residents. And we've had that body of case law forever in here in Florida. So I think notwithstanding whether the governor's order expires, the boards do have certain discretion to continue on with some of these restrictions. One of the restrictions that I, I you know, see having some uh, d debate here is a lot of the rules prohibiting just uh, very strict prohibiting vendors and certain guests from coming into the community. That I see as an area that we might have to revisit more quickly than allowing people free access to the clubhouse for whatever club they want. I think they're two separate issues. And I want to jump in on that as well. If you pass a rule during the time the emergency powers were granted to the association, such as, okay, everyone needs to wear a mask when in the elevator. When you, if you want full enforcement power, when the emergency powers, uh, the statutory emergency powers come to an end, I would suggest that at the next properly noticed board meeting, all rules adopted to protect the association health, safety, welfare from COVID-19 matters, whatever they may be, be ratified at a properly noticed board meeting so that if it's a, a rule affecting common element, common areas, it's 48 hour notice. If it's affecting what someone can do in their unit, it's 14 day notice. You want to dot all I's and cross all T's if you want to be in the uh, clear zone for enforcement. And I also want to mention to those from Broward County that just because Broward County may have extended a state of emergency for its county, the statutory emergency powers do in fact reference section 252.36 of Florida statutes, which means that only the governor's state of emergency, um, when he calls the state of emergency, then you can use the emergency powers in the statute, not when the county declares its own state of emergency. I think it, it gets back to having a plan, right? Like this is gonna unwind at some point in time. So what does it look like for your association? And that's what we're, you know, we're kind of advocating. Um, we have a couple more minutes, Brendan. I just yeah. want to touch base. Yeah, um, I wanted to mention one thing in regards to when when we do get to the point where we're 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 ready to open up 
some of the amenities. I, it's come to my attention from a couple of clients that there are companies out there that will do the sanitation and some of them have alluded to the fact that insurance would cover the cost of, of that sanitation or cleaning. And I'm not familiar with any policy that has any language of that type. So I just wanted to caution people, you know, I believe that that's more of a, a sales pitch than, than the reality. So please be cautious. And that. yes, um, Craig, I've gotten so many questions. I've seen fly through on the screen and got on email while we're doing this. Can the association require facial coverings in their open areas, common area, common element areas? And I think, yeah, you, you most certainly can. Um, certainly by board adoption of a properly adopted rule, under the circumstances, you can require it. If you hope to enforce it, I, I suggest to you that you go through the formal rule adoption process uh, just as soon as you can, though that's not required during the state of emergency due to the emergency powers in the statute. Okay, guys, well, I'm going to, let me uh, summarize. We've had a lot of uh, discussion this afternoon, answered a lot of questions. Thank you very much. We talked about the legislative environment. You know, the emergency order by the governor is still in place. That allows the association to have some special emergency powers pursuant to the statute. We'll be watching to see how that unwinds in the next day or so and whether, what implications that have that has. We're advocating for a framework, having a framework for your association relative to your amenities and a plan um, for sure. Have that approved by your attorney. Watch the legislation as it changes because that'll create uh, changes to your plan, the timing timeline for your plan. But you should have one and you should communicate it uh, to your residents. We talked about today's reality specifically as it relates to uh, outdoor amenities, a lot of time on pools because that was a lot of the, uh, those are a lot of the questions we, we got. And I think we learned that in Palm Beach, a little more uh, restrictive. We talked about volunteers um, monitoring, doing the required monitoring, and maybe that's not such a great idea, but uh, certainly something you, if, if that's your only option, something you want to discuss with your attorney and figure out what training protocols, how you limit your risk, right? How you mitigate your risk. We talked a little bit about what's next, which is really your framework, right? What, how are your amenities going to come on? How are you going to continue to practice the CDC guidelines? We don't have any uh, time for any other questions. We are, we will address some of them uh, on the 21st. So we'll uh, welcome uh, everyone back on the 21st. I did get a question on here. If you want uh, this, this uh, presentation webinar will be posted on our website, and I think you can find it on uh, K. Bender Renbaum's website as well. If you are interested in receiving a copy of our playbook uh, for reopening, uh, just email info at castlegroup.com and we'll send it to you. I wanted to remind everybody who's still on, um, it uh, is Teacher Appreciation Week. And I think parents who have kids at home, I'm sure would appreciate uh, at this point uh, just how much work teachers do uh, because they're, you're, you're now teaching. so. We wanted to take an opportunity to uh, thank all our teachers. Uh, May is also Mental Awareness Month. Um, at Castle, we wear green for mental awareness on May 18th. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who have been cooped up for a long time, uh, so it's uh, particularly re relevant at this point in time. Jeff and, and Allison and Brendan, I want to thank you very much for participating. Uh, your guidance has been uh, expert as usual. Uh, for everybody listening, uh, thanks again, and we'll look forward to hearing from you uh, or checking in with you again in a couple of weeks. So uh, have a great afternoon, everybody. And Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.